understand who you're meeting with. Take a look at their LinkedIn profile. What are they hoping to get out of the meeting, right? Not what you're hoping to get out of the meeting. What are they hoping to get out of the meeting? Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Entrepreneurship 101. You are the brave people that have bear, like gone through snowmageddon to get here, so we appreciate you coming. Um, we hope that our satellite partners, uh, NORCAT Innovation Factory and Haltech, are also here, at where, and you're not experiencing the massive amounts of snow that we have in Toronto. Um, it's pretty crazy out there. Um, just by way of introduction, we are um, actually having Mark Elliott, who was on the video, is speaking tonight on B2B sales, and he is um, also one of the speakers that has been coming back year upon year, I guess you're on your third year now, um, with Entrepreneurship 101. And he's also one of the, um, the, the, the instructors in our certificate program for the University of Toronto, the School of Continuing Studies, and he'll be presenting a course on uh, marketing and sales starting in late uh, June and early July. If if you like what you see here, you can get more of him that way. Um, a couple announcements before I do his bio. So we had the uh, the upstart application deadline was last Friday, and we had the most applications ever, which is tremendously exciting for us. So we had uh, probably 30% more than last year. Um, we had close to 70 applications, which is amazing. Um, applicants will be notified about the results of the executive summary submissions by February 14th. So we will notify everybody who submitted, um, and some will be going on to another round where they will meet with an advisor. Um, there's a couple different rounds um, to get to whittling down to the final 10 that will work with uh, advisors on their pitch. So we're pretty excited about that and we thank everybody for applying. It's pretty exciting to see the interest. Also happening, and uh, the applications are due next Friday, is we're bringing back our Mars F Future Leaders program, which is our program for teens aged 13 to 15, where they go through a five-day boot camp over March break. If you know anybody in this space, anybody who's got sort of this age group, kids, definitely share the information with them. It's a really fun camp. It's very interactive. They meet tons of entrepreneurs. And even if they're not interested in becoming an entrepreneur, it's a good exercise in creativity and building a business and kind of, and having that entrepreneurial mindset. So we encourage uh, you to spread the word about the Mars Future Leaders Program, which is coming up soon. And lastly, we have a, a upcoming Lived It lecture with Ted Riley. Uh, Ted Riley is right now, he's uh, the CEO of Technologies, Inno Technologies Innovation Group Canada, but he built a company, you might remember Alliance. Atlantis Communications, which was later sold to CanWest Global Communications in 2008. It was the biggest television production and distribution company in Canada at the time it was sold, and they made lots of great shows and productions. So he's a pretty dynamic speaker. I think you'll really enjoy him, and it's his first time speaking at Mars. He'll be here Wednesday, February 19th from 6 to 7 p.m. And with that, I would like to uh, introduce Mark by way of his bio. He is the co-founder of Venture Accelerator Partners, which is a company that provides part-time sales and marketing assistance to growing firms. So he works with startups of all stages and in a lot of different industries. He has over 15 years of sales, marketing, and management experience. VA Partners has worked with over 15, 50 companies in the last five years. He was telling me before um, the presentation started that he has worked and traveled a lot and worked everywhere from the Rust Belt and Ohio Ohio to Abu Dhabi. Some of the successes uh, VA partners include closing multiple customers to create a $600,000 annual annuity stream for a finance company, working with a clean tech firm to close $4 million in opportunities, and leveraging social media for an account that led to over $100,000 in sales. So with that, I'd like to welcome Mark Elliott. Thank you for your applause, but first thing you should do is give yourself all a round of applause for being here today. Thank you for coming in. I'm excited, hopefully you're excited. I have a bit of a cold, so I'm, I'm sounding super, super deep voice tonight. So, um, uh, and uh, hopefully that was a, a really wonderful warm up video of some of the highlights from a past presentation. We'll go over a few of those things as we, as we get going. A couple things to, uh, to look for. Remember the uh, hashtag ENT101 if you uh, want to share on uh, Twitter. And uh, Mars uh, DD is the, uh, the Twitter handle for Mars. And mine is Mark E. Elliott. So there's uh, a couple E's in the middle there, a couple L's, and a couple T's. So that'll be on every slide so you can share and make fun of me while I'm up presenting. 
but it will look at every single tweet afterwards and see who's been sharing positive things. So just to get a feel for the crowd, um, <clears throat> maybe people can uh, raise their hand if they're a solopreneur. So they're kind of the one, they are the company. A few of those people. A few people that maybe have a small, small business, maybe two people to 20 people. Yeah, how about medium-sized business? 20 people to, let's say, 100 people. No? Any large business, anyone over at work for a company over 100 employees? Yeah, okay, so most, but most looks like everybody, almost everybody here is what, you know, really is, um, let's say it's probably a startup, that's great. And everybody here loves sales, right? Yeah? I think it's the kind of, when, you're, when you have your own business, or you're part of a growing business, and I think if you're part of a startup, everybody's in sales, right? And uh, some more than others, but really everybody's in sales. And uh, it's probably, besides developing your product or solution, it's the biggest <laughs> part of the business, right? So I'm glad everyone is here is very interested in learning a few more things about sales. So we're gonna go through a few items, quite a few items. Um, we'll talk about value proposition, we'll talk about targets, we'll talk about types of sales. So there's not just one sort of type or, or type of position for sales, but many. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about something I've been talking about a lot more over the last year, which is uh, kind of marketing, kind of sales, but it's something that I think every small business should be looking at, and it's uh, driving inbound leads. We'll go through some really handy sales process tools. Uh, we'll talk about a CRM. Uh, if you don't know what it is, we'll talk about it. Uh, we'll talk about everyone's favorite sales activity, the cold call. Um, we'll talk about leveraging social media, some other sales tactics, um, some uh, idea for a really great meeting plan, some great resources, and at the end, you'll have, question, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so, without further ado, we'll, we'll get started. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, Kerry kind of covered, covered this, but uh, I love working with entrepreneurs, and I love working with people and helping people with sales. So, it sounds like we have the right group here today. <clears throat> so has anyone been to Ottawa for Winterlude? Yes? If you haven't been, I, this is one of the, it's a, it's a slice of Canadiana that you, you know, you really can't get almost anywhere else. It's a really unique thing. There's kilometers and kilometers of frozen canal you can skate on. <clears throat> and what better to tempt a weary cold skater than a Beaver Tails location with its warm beverages and of course, different types of Beaver Tails, right? <clears throat> so uh, we're not always in our business, we're not always so lucky to have, uh, you know, have this kind of advantage as it were. Um, but really, I think one of the big things that people, one of the biggest issues when I work with entrepreneurs is separating out the features or the functions of their solution from the benefits. You know, at the end of the day, to, to be honest, your customers and prospects don't really care about, <laughs> uh, you know, how it does what your solution does. They care about how it helps them. And really the four things that you should be helping them with is helping to increase revenue, helping to decrease uh, expenses or cost, helping to make them more productive, either people or machinery or process, and also avoiding something bad. And avoiding something bad can mean uh, a bad PR experience. It could mean maybe an employee getting hurt at work. Um, these sort of things are bad things for organizations, and so they'll, they'll do things to avoid these bad things from happening. One of the ways to make your value proposition strong is to quantify the benefit. You know, if, you, if you're talking to uh, a CFO, as an example, for an organization, and you're pitching them cost savings, sometimes they have internal benchmarks for where they'll look at projects, how much money it'll save the organization. If you can give them an idea of a percentage or an absolute dollar as an estimate, that will get the conversation started, right? Um, 
so having those, being able to quantify the benefits of your solution can go a long way to helping you with that winning value proposition. It's also you know, important to understand that you may have multiple value propositions for uh, your product, your solution, and they'll change depending on who the target customer or contact is. So I'll, I'll give you an example. We're working with a, uh, an organization that has a smartphone app that allows uh, restaurant customers to go in to view a menu and to order items from the menu and even pay from their smartphone. It also has lots of nutritional information and lots of pictures that you can view. So, you know, why is that? You know, so we would, we would talk to an organization that maybe was a very busy around events, and we talk about how you can turn over tables, how you can increase the check size. If we were talking to an organization that was maybe focused on more nutritional elements of food, we talk about how the app makes it easy for customers to find their restaurant that has specific nutritional um, applications like you know, gluten-free that allows them to have nutritional information right at the fingertips. So it's the same solution, we're just changing the value proposition to, to meet the, uh, the targets, what they're gonna care about. And also think about how you're different than your competitors. And if someone says, oh, that we don't have any competitors, <laughs> there's always a competitor. And a competitor could be status quo, right? So the competitor could be doing what they're doing today. But you almost always have a competitor of some sort. How do you differentiate? And it's great for you to weave in how you're different than, uh, than your competitor into that as well. Another great Canadian experience, and it's winter, curling. Has anyone here curled before? Yes? Yes, if you haven't curled, it's a really fun, something fun to do. And uh, you know, half the fun is just being able to yell at each other um, to hurry hard. Uh, but you know, one of the things in curling is you know, getting close to the middle of the house. And in terms of targets, the one thing, the biggest issue I run into from a target perspective with entrepreneurs is, where does your solution fit in? Who's your best, uh, best target? Our solution can work for anybody. As a growing firm, that's really difficult to scale <laughs> and really difficult to get a foothold. So I'd recommend uh, you know, picking a vertical, an industry vertical, uh, which could be maybe I'm, I want to sell to uh, retailers. Uh, maybe I want to sell to farmers. <laughs> you know, maybe I want to sell to government. Um, those are all different verticals as an example. Uh, you could also have a horizontal focus. So there's a couple of really great examples of this here in Toronto uh, with companies like FreshBooks and Wave Accounting. They really focus on sort of the size of organizations and, uh, and the type of business that they're in, which is, you know, for FreshBooks as an example, lots of uh, consulting organizations, lots of solopreneurs. Um, <clears throat> you know, the key when you, when you, when you target this market, the segment, you get to know it really well, and you, become, you can become an expert in it. You, know, you can talk the way they talk, you can be known in that, in that space, and you can also know in this, the, the unique challenges that they face. And so this targeting verticals or targeting horizontals is an excellent way to, to start out with targets. You wanna think about who the best contacts are within the organization to target. And I like to start as high as possible within organizations as close as you can to the decision maker. It's much easier to go down in an organization than it is to go up. Um, so I think that's you know, one, of the, one of the things I would recommend is, is uh, trying to start with somebody that would be close to the top of the organization. Also, um, <clears throat> had a, uh, a gentleman named uh, Fraser Kelton from a company called Get Glue. Are you familiar, anyone familiar with Get Glue? Anybody? It's one of the, yeah, one of the first uh, second screen applications. Um, and Fraser's actually from Hamilton. So shout out to the Innovation Factory folks if they're on watching us. <clears throat> but Fraser was from Hamilton, moved to New York, and has recently come back. But for them, they had a, they had a finite amount of targets. So they just figured out how to get in those targets. They didn't worry about <laughs> anybody else but those targets. 
of some organizations in the crowd, you may have thousands of potential targets. So you, know, you don't need to be, um, you, know, you focus on the best contact and move on. In some cases, you want to focus on multiple contacts because you really want to get that, that organization as a, as a, as a customer. Uh, and also realize that all organizations don't work the same way. Many work similarly, but they all may not work the same way. And uh, yeah, and call high. <clears throat> does, anyone, does anyone know what show this is from? A couple of people? Probably one of the funniest shows I think ever on, on television. Uh, it's from Arrested Development. It's a banana, uh, their frozen banana stand. Um, this is a form of direct sales. Uh, but there are different types of sales. And you may, at the beginning when you're, you know, you're, you're starting out, you may do, I would say, unnatural things. Maybe your solution doesn't really lend itself to uh, a direct or outbound sales effort because maybe it's too expensive. Uh, it's tough to, you know, your clients are all over the world. But it may make sense at the beginning to, to do those things, to go meet them in person, to do cold calls, all those sort of things, because you have to get those first few clients on. And as you're looking, after you've got those first few clients on, and you're looking to scale the business, <clears throat> then you need to look at how much, does it, how much is my cost of sale? Um, how do my clients buy? How do they make decisions? Where do they get information from? And then you can, you know, you can add a number of different types of sales roles. Am I going to sell direct to the organization? Am I going to sell through a channel? Maybe the channel partner is the best way to go. So the channel, the channel partner becomes your client. <clears throat> Do I have people, uh, you know, salespeople that are going outbound to go see clients face to face? Am I going to have an inside uh, role where, where I'm having, you know, maybe I'm generating inbound leads or I'm just doing everything over the phone or with webinars or the email? <clears throat> and the other piece I think that's, I think you're going to see this become more and more and a bigger part of um, the B2B sales success is uh, marketing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And uh, <clears throat> people, are people familiar with uh, the term content marketing? Anyone? A couple people, a few people? Content marketing from a B2B perspective is one of the best methods of, of inbound lead generation. <clears throat> and um, you know, I just had a conversation with, a, with a, um, a prospect today that actually we got verbal on after I got home from the snowstorm in Hamilton, uh, that they were going to go go ahead with us, and a big part of the conversation we had today was around making sure that they had not just a website that looks great, but a website that helps to drive business for them, drive leads for them. And the great thing about this for entrepreneurs today is it's really easy to get a great-looking functional website. You can get a $50 WordPress theme uh, that you can set up, and you don't need a lot of technical expertise, and you can, you, can, you can set it up and you can add some of these different free services that help you get found. For your website, you want to make sure it's easy to update. You don't want to have to go to a developer or a third party to update. This allows you to create new pages for campaigns, it allows you to add new products or features, new landing pages. <clears throat> you want to be able to make sure that you have the ability to do things like blogs, white papers, ability to have um, form capture for email marketing, ability to have social media integration, and you know, also the ability to be able to have SEO, which is search engine optimization, and making sure that the search engines can find your website. You're making it easy for them to find your website. And you know, that you're being found for the right terms, the right keywords. And I think today it's really, you know, a, the great thing about almost all of those components is you as entrepreneurs, it, it, it takes time, <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily take a lot of money. Email, can't, email tools are free to $30 a month in some cases. You know, the, a WordPress theme is cheap. Hosting is inexpensive. Social media is free. The tools are free. <laughs> Um, again, you can do a lot of this stuff yourself, and as you're bootstrapping and getting started, you know, you can, you can, do, the, you can do these things. Um, 
and we'll have I'll maybe have a I'll maybe have a, a bonus question afterwards if anyone can actually remember what Christopher Walken said instead of this more sales leads what the actual word is maybe there'll be some surprise or something someone knows a couple of people know shout it if you know it cowbell, cowbell yes <clears throat> um, part of the uh, part of the video I talked about it's hard to know where you're going. <laughs> You know, if you don't have a plan, right? And part of it is understanding the steps in your sales process from start to finish. And the reason why you want to outline this is because the process may change. You also, as you add members to your team or you have team members, you can make sure that everybody's on the same page. And the great thing as well, as you're growing your organization, is you can have different people within your, inside the organization handling different stages within inside the funnel, as an example. So we like to break it down into this, what appears to be a five stage, but is actually six. There's a magical stage that I'll talk about it. Um, but you know, it starts with prospecting, which is either an inbound lead comes in, or you know, you're, you're cold calling, you're targeting somebody, you're meeting somebody at a networking event. The next step is trying to qualify them. Make, see if there's a fit between your solution, your product, and your prospect. Uh, the next is when you're proposing. I'm, I'm, I'm demoing them, I'm presenting, I'm doing a proposal, I'm meeting different people within the organization. Uh, and then, this, the, you know, then they've decided, yes, this makes sense. This is a bit of a simplification here, of, of course, as well. But, you know, they decided yes. And then they've, you know, but just saying, just saying yes and actually paying for your product <laughs> are two different things. So we like to have the, the next step, which is called rollout. And, you know, the other step that's not here, that's often the step you learn the most from at the beginning of your, org of your, of your organization is closed, lost. And that's where you didn't win something. And you can have those conversations with your prospect about why they didn't select you. And often people ask questions, more questions, after they lost <laughs> than after they won. You're so happy you won some business that you uh, don't necessarily ask why you won the business. And there's some other tools, uh, you know, great things to do. So one of the things I think a lot of organizations fo focus at the beginning is on revenue, which is good. But things have to happen first to get to the revenue. And by focusing on the activities that drive the revenue, if I do a lot of these activities, enough of these activities, I'm gonna drive revenue out through the funnel or the pipeline, whatever you call it. And those activities could be, you know, number of call calls, number of networking events, uh, number of meetings or demos, a number of uh, proposals sent out. All those things can be really great indicators of activity that you can use to measure how you and your team members are doing to get to, uh, to, get to a sale, which, which comes, comes later. Um, one of the other things you can do, as I take a quick sip of water, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> other thing you can do is um, you know, making it easy for you to handle some of the more challenging things or repeatable things in the sales process. Getting a list of your common objections. What, what's the objection and how do you handle it? Because there's nothing worse than being on that phone when someone, or being face to face with someone in a meeting and them telling you why your solution will never work at their organization, right? And so, you know, being able to overcome specific objections and having it written out allows you to handle them more quickly and more confidently. And it's, that's, you know, honestly, that's one of the hardest things to do uh, in the sales process is when someone says, you know, this is probably not going to work for these reasons. And then you can, you can ask, have the confidence to say, well, let's talk about that a little bit more. Or how about, how would this, would this overcome that objection? Other things like making email templates. So creating an email template that you would send to, to a contact. You want to, you want to, if you're sending it to one person, you want to tweak it specifically for them. But a majority of the body you can probably use over and over again or having different types of emails for different types of, of customers. Uh, another thing is having a telephone script. So probably two hardest things you'll do is handling objections and calling someone you've never talked to that maybe isn't, isn't expecting to talk to you that day. So having that telephone script ready is a great way to um, maybe overcome that, something that's, that's challenging to do. Sales CRM. So how many folks here in the crowd are using a CRM as part of 
as part of their sales efforts? How many people plan to? As if you, so everybody else, shame on you. <laughs> you know, I really think as you grow, you really want to look at a CRM. Uh, you know, and you say, well, I don't, I don't have a lot of money to spend. Zoho is free, up to three users. Again, no excuse. Um, you know, there's other ones. You know, one that we like to recommend a lot is uh, Salesforce.com. You know, it's not the prettiest to look at, but it works really well. And uh, the Group Edition is a great, great license package for for growing firms. And it's not just about keeping track of my contacts. It's about how I'm structuring data. These contacts, this account. It also can record past activities and plan future activities. So you're, you know, you've you've done the research. You've called somebody up, or you met them at a, you had a meeting. I'm happy with my current provider. My contract runs two more years. You've got all this information on this organization. <laughs> you met with them. You know that the contract's up in two years. That may be an opportunity to switch. Don't throw it all away. <laughs> Record it in your CRM, schedule future activities like a call or an email or check and make sure the contact's still there um, inside your CRM uh, so that you can then you know, be in a good position when that opportunity comes up. You know, record your opportunities. It has the ability to add notes. You can have leads come right from your website directly into, into your CRM. It allows you to then qualify them and, and set up future act actions. And again, it's a great way to share information. You can do your forecast reviews in it. You can do account reviews in it. And if you're working with a team, you have people working on accounts uh, that are passing it off to other members of the team. You have a great snapshot of what's been done. So if you're not using a CRM, think about using one. There's, there's not a lot of money or no money. And it'll, you know, your sales investment, it will you know, it'll return it's, it's the, the number one tool I recommend for, sale, for sales, bar none. <clears throat> I think I actually took this picture today on the way back. No, it's not. It's from, it's from the interweb. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, I wanted to touch on a few of the kind of harder things or challenging things um, that you go through as part of the sales cycle. And one was cold calls. And I, you know, I like to think that you can turn them almost into warm calls. And there's a few, few ways you can do that. One strategy we like to use is we actually send an email first. Uh, and we, we like to send, you can, you, can, you can use an email tool, but if it's a one-off you know, target, send, you know, send that targeted email into them. And you can then follow up and ask about the email. <laughs> you get a lot of people maybe email back first. Some people may say, yes, I've read it, not interested. Or they may say, I'm not read it, I haven't read it, let's, get, let's talk about it. It's a great way to start the conversation. You know, I think how to make cold calls, you know, that's a way to turn your cold call into warm call, as well as doing research on the target. Understand what that contact does. Understand what's important to that organization. Use words they use. You know, talk about maybe there's a trigger event, something that happened. You know, I have, a, I have a client that we work with that has, uh, um, does workplace design and for, uh, furniture. So when you see a funding announcement <laughs> for a tech startup, you know, that's a trigger event. If you read on the Economic Development Board that someone's going to move to a new city in two years and build a plant, that's a trigger event. Understand those things are going on, and so you can use that as part of the conversation. Um, you know, and ways to make it easy for you, because <clears throat> it is, this is actually really hard. And I'm also not saying that you have to do it every, you have to all, you have to do it as part of the sales cycle. But in some cases, if it's a B2B sales, at some point you're gonna be making <laughs> cold calls. And, you know, make it easy for you, book time in your schedule. That way it doesn't wait maybe, you know, I get all the fun stuff done first and then I'm gonna cold call. Book little blocks of time in your schedule. Understand what your goal is for the cold call. Often it's I'm not going to sell them over the phone. I want them to set up some time so that we can have a scheduled conversation. I'm not trying to get them to buy my $50,000 solution over the phone in two minutes. I want to get them interested enough in a two minute conversation or a five minute conversation or a one minute conversation to schedule some time to have a detailed conversation, right? 
Um, you know, we talked about doing the research. Make sure you're calling the right person. Prepare for objections you may face, especially at the beginning. Have them, you know, have them up on your computer screen or have them printed out beside you. So it's really easy for you to get to them and, and just give you that comfort of knowing it's there like a, like a security blanket. Or even, you know, a, war, you know, a Canada Goose coat on a cold Toronto winter night. And for your different uh, customers or verticals, you'll be able to find the best times to call. For a lot, if you're trying to reach C-level people or directors, a lot of time the best time to call is first thing in the morning. You know, call at 7.30 or 8 or 8.30 before the gatekeeper's in, before the rest of the work <laughs> gets in the way. If, uh, you know, if, and also call at the end of the day after a lot of your coworkers have gone home. Uh, it's a good time to call. If you're calling on different types of organizations, you may also notice that uh, like, uh, for example, restaurants. If you're trying to get a hold of the general manager for a restaurant, the best time is typically between 2.30 and 4.30 in the afternoon, in between dinner and lunch. <coughs> Excuse me. It'll give you time to, uh, to read the screen about a social media interaction I had just over two weeks ago. So this is some of them I follow on Twitter. I'm, I, I'm connected to, I know fairly well. <clears throat> they were looking for a full-time resource to help them. I asked Jamie maybe that a part-time resource would help them in the short term. He said, great idea. And uh, this company is a client of ours as of uh, February the 3rd. Um, so again, this is just you know, a trigger event that happened in a, twi in a tweet. <laughs> that was able to, to turn into some closed business. There's some other stuff that went into it. I have a relationship, but again, you may have a relationship with partners, with people you meet at networking events. So it's just, just an example. How many people here are on LinkedIn? Yeah, good. Seems like almost everybody. Uh, LinkedIn, if you're gonna have one uh, B2B uh, social media tool, I recommend LinkedIn. It's the, uh, it's the most productive, I think. Uh, there's a few tips to being successful at LinkedIn. Having a complete profile, making it easy to connect. Check out your security settings. Sometimes your picture doesn't show up. <laughs> Sometimes it may be you know, your, uh, your URL uh, where people can share your information may not show up. Make it really easy for people to connect with you. I like to connect after face-to-face uh, -face meetings or uh, telephone calls, or um, networking events. Uh, that's when I like to connect with individuals. Uh, it's, when you're starting a business, this is absolutely the best way to get those first customers because you can leverage your uh, first connections. So if you have one client, odds are that that client maybe knows other people within the industry. If your first client thinks you did a great job, they may be able to make an introduction for you. Half the time, you just have to tell them who you'd like to talk to. So again, it's a great way to get started. Um, the, I use, I have a paid subscription, but you don't need to. You can use, um, use free, the free version. And uh, you know, it's a great way to, to you know, if you have the page, you do get things to grow emails, which allow you to send uh, kind of like introductory uh, connections or introductory messages to people you're not connected with. So it's a, a great way to, to do that. Response rate is about, I find is about 10%. So it's slightly more than a, than, a, than a cold email. And it's amazing the research you can do with this. So we just, we have a new client that started. Uh, they provide a safety training and on-site support for oil and gas based in Calgary, uh, Edmonton and Alberta in general. I was able to do a search in LinkedIn on all my second connections that are in oil and gas, that are in Calgary, Edmonton, or Alberta. It showed up over 500 possible connections, second connections. I was able then to go look at my first connections and determine which of those I thought would be 
good at making introductions uh, to, uh, to these prospects on behalf of one of my clients. So again, that search took literally 10 seconds to, to pull up the data. It took me three or four hours to go through, um, but you know, it's a great way to, to, do, to find information. So invaluable. Twitter, how many people here are on Twitter? Yeah, not quite as many. You know, I think LinkedIn is the best. Twitter is good, is good, and especially depending on what verticals you're, 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 um, you're calling on. If you're calling on um, other tech companies, uh, you know, creative um, types, uh, there are, you know, marketing companies, retailers, there is a very high percentage of those people on Twitter. But I would be say you'd also likely be surprised that companies that maybe you would view as being old school or technology or traditional would have people within those organizations on Twitter as well. You can use tools to help you out like Hootsuite, which is another great Canadian uh, tech success story out of Vancouver, <coughs> to uh, help organize your social media, schedule tweets, create lists, and help you engage. <coughs> just as I did with Jamie. I have another example I'd like to show. It's a conversation between an uh, organization that does uh, pictures of inside of venues <coughs> with uh, a marketing leader from Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment. It all happened on Saturday. One person thanking the other for following them. The other saying, I think we'd be interested in your services. Contact this person, here's her Twitter handle. That other person that was included on the, on, the, on the tweet then interacted and then booking a meeting on a Saturday <laughs> in, uh, in the fall. It's just incredible what can happen. Um, one of the great things about Twitter, create lists. Create lists of your prospects, create lists of partners, create, create lists of your, uh, of your competitors. You can, then, you can, if you're, then you can focus on those things specifically when you go in. And don't be afraid to engage. Uh, I think one of the most powerful things you can do is on social media, share someone else's information. You know, a retweet's like a warm hug, right? Everybody loves a retweet, everyone loves a mention. Uh, so if, if you do it for people, they'll do it back to you, right? So, you know, that's the great thing about social media is, is, is sharing and connecting as well. <clears throat> I like this, uh, you know, I like this, this, this little uh, cartoon here. Our study concludes that, that this is a percentage of customers who will buy from us without any effort whatsoever, whatsoever on our part, 0%. And I think when you, you know, sometimes when you build a solution, you build it, they will come. You need to build it and then the hard work starts. And the hard work is sales and marketing. And you know, part of that is researching, understanding the right types of targets and customers. And again, social media like LinkedIn, Twitter are great forms of research. Also, uh, it's amazing what you can find on the web with some different searches on job titles, on events and news, on Google Alerts. Another great tool is uh, data.com, which used to be called Jigsaw. It's essentially an online repository of contacts. It's, you put a contact in, you get a contact out. You can also pay for a subscription as well. Again, it's a great way to, to, to find some details on people you're trying to get in touch with. You know, sending targeted emails is another great way to, um, to stay on, uh, you know, to make those early introductions, to, um, to, to start looking at new prospects and networking. Uh, the one thing I often see, the one challenge with networking for entrepreneurs is they like to go to networking events where other entrepreneurs are at, which is okay, but look for networking events where customers or partners may be at. Uh, you know, and sometimes that may be uncomfortable to do. Uh, so, just, you know, when you go to a networking event, realize that everybody there is there for business purposes. Lots of times the people that you're talking to or plan to talk to are maybe just as shy as, <laughs> as you may be. So there's a couple ways you can overcome this. Number one is, before you go to a networking event, um, have a bet with people within the company, your significant other, a friend, a mentor, about how many people you're gonna to talk to that night. And you need business cards to prove 
uh, that you've done it. And if they don't have a business card, they can write on the back of yours, right? So, so you, can, you can do that. Another thing at networking events, another tip is don't ask them what they do. Don't talk at all about yourself. Ask them what they do. You'll be amazed. People love to talk about themselves. Look at me. I'm up here talking for like an hour, right? So people love to talk about themselves. Ask them a question. Why are they at the event? What are they there? And, and it'll be amazing. They'll say, oh, I'm here. I'm hoping to meet this type of person. And you say, well, I actually just met Fred 20 minutes ago, and I think that may be somebody you could talk to. Or they may be looking for something you can provide, right? And then after they're done talking, they'll ask what you do. <laughs> and then it's a great way to have that introduction when not feel like you're selling, right? And really, um, that is the trick in sales. <laughs> the biggest trick in sales is not talking, is listening. And, <clears throat> you know, and, and this, this kind of goes to this, you know, the meeting, having a face-to-face -face meeting or a scheduled call, it takes a lot of effort. It's a really awesome experience we can have these. But I find that a lot of entrepreneurs waste that opportunity by not planning for it enough. And so this is just a simple uh, example of a meeting plan as a sample agenda. It's very helpful as well as if you go with two people on the same team, make sure you guys, make sure guys, girls are together prepared. Understand who you're meeting with. Have, under, take a look at their LinkedIn profile. Understand what the role is. Understand if they're connected to any of the same people you're connected with. What are they hoping to get out of the meeting, <laughs> right? Not what you're hoping to get out of the meeting. What are they hoping to get out of the meeting? What are your goals for the meeting? And one of the most important things are, what's the next step? So I've met with a lot of prospects that we had a great demo. How do you know? It went great. You know, what's the next step? Hopefully they'll call us, right? So in that meeting, talk about next steps. What's involved? Talk about, you know, purchasing decision, timelines, all those sort of things. At a next step, the next step is the last slide in every single presentation I have, except for this one, which is questions. But have it as every single sales presentation as the, as the last slide, next steps. And at the beginning of the meeting, ask questions. Ask lots of questions. Ask them what they're hoping to get out of this meeting. Ask them what was interesting about your visiting our site. You know, ask them about a specific process. Ask them about their business. Ask them questions that are going to help lead you down the path of aligning your solution and helping to fix their problem. And I think as salespeople, we, people have the perception of a used car salesman, right? Out on the lot, trying to sell a lemon to somebody. For sales, modern sales, it's win-win. The customer wins and the organization selling the product wins. I think, you know, as an entrepreneur, and even, you know, being an entrepreneur looking to have some help in sales, this is a great time to have a business. There's so many resources available to you. You know, one of the best ones, and I'm, I talk about this when I talk to people from all over the world, uh, when I talk to people all over Ontario about the support you can get from Mars. Not just in events, which you run great events, but there's a huge repository of information up on the site not just about sales and marketing, but all about lots of different things as it pertains to, um, to starting your business. So, but even specifically for, for sales and marketing, there's lots of great content, articles, presentations. Was anyone here to see Mark Evans present a couple weeks ago? Again, great, uh, great presenter, uh, great blog if you want to follow it. Um, great person to follow on Twitter. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you know, just an example of the kind of people that come in and present. If you didn't make see Mark's presentation, it's up on the web. You know, if you're maybe in from out of town, if you're based in Hamilton, or you're based in Halton, or you're based in Waterloo, you know, Hall Tech, Communitech have, and uh, Innovation Factory have sales peer-to-peer -peer groups you can join. Talk to other sales professionals. If you want to kick it old school, you want to get a book, uh, How to Be a Rainmaker is an uh, excellent book about kind of the, the, the uh, little insights into sales. Little things like 
when you get a seat in the restaurant, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, make sure that that you're facing the customer, not facing out. <laughs> you want to, you want to, you know, want to, you want to have their, you know, be divided attention on them, not what's going on in the restaurant, right? Never buy a coffee on the way to a sales call in case you spill it on yourself. And also more practical things, but that's a pretty practical thing. It doesn't have one of my favorites. Always carry a Tide stick with you. But uh, Profit Magazine, which is a, a magazine as well as a website, a great source of sales and marketing. Inc. and Entrepreneur, which are, are U.S.-based uh, organizations. Uh, there's a, lots of LinkedIn groups. Uh, there's sales and marketing for Canadian startups, which is one that we help to manage. Uh, if you're really interested in social selling and, and um, you know, sales for life, again, a great, lots of great blogs, almost a blog a day they do. Uh, white papers you can download. Um, and also your, uh, your sales playbook. And uh, please visit uh, Venture Accelerator Partners website. We have uh, blogs, white papers, uh, newsletters. Um, we do an events recap. Uh, highlighting some of the different events that are going on in uh, the Toronto to Waterloo to Hamilton corridor on a, on a monthly basis. So, yeah. So that's the, uh, the presentation. Uh, I'll leave it on this slide because it's a good slide. I guess the next, next step will be me taking another sip of water <laughs> and you getting ready to ask some questions. And I'll be ready to answer them. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> We've, we've spent a lot of time this year talking about business model, the business model and customer development and sort of checking the assumptions in your business model. And I think sales is the ultimate test of is your business model sustainable, is whether or not people are actually going to pay for your service. So it's very, very an important uh, part of having a business. And just to give it only one lecture um, in Entrepreneurship 101 is a bit of a disservice. It's that important. We do have workshop series called B2B Sales that will take you, you can work with other entrepreneurs to um, work on your sales call script and um, d develop your funnel and, and all the kinds of sales techniques. So if you're interested in more, there is more. And uh, with that, we have a question on the left. How you doing, Mark? Thank you, first of all. This was a fantastic presentation. Oh, great. Um, Thanks. We'll come back anytime. <laughs> definitely will. Okay, your question. The uh, question is that your advice is stemming around, uh, it sounds like it's stemming more, more to private sector selling, but what about pub public sector, and in particular, universities and colleges? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, you know, universities and colleges, you're going to have different um, types of government selling. So federal government is a lot of RFP-based. Uh, you'll also get some universities and colleges will also sometimes have RFPs and sometimes not have RFPs. So I don't think fundamentally that this, the selling is, is different. I'm trying to find the benefit for that uh, post-secondary institution. And <clears throat> I'm trying to make sure I'm contacting the right people. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm delivering benefits to them. And again, I've, we, we work with an organization that had about 20 different digital solutions for universities and colleges. After we were done working with them, they only focused on about four. And those four were in areas that drove revenue for the school or helped with them with um, save money or helped them improve the hireability of their students. And so if you find the right solution, uh, you can make it work. Um, selling to universities, it, each faculty department is like a separate organization almost. Selling to colleges is sometimes easier because it's run more like a business where they'll have you know, more of a central purchasing area and those sort of things. So um, it's not easy, but it is possible. But the, fundamentally, a bunch of the, the other things around it are, are the same. The only thing that may be a little bit different is you may have to go to RFP as mandated, but if you're selling to a bank in Canada, you probably have to go to RFP <laughs> as well. So it's not gonna be much different. I don't know if that was insightful or not. No, that, that was very helpful, All right? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, how's it going? Mackenzie Ellis, um, great presentation. Um, quick question about <clears throat> consumer, like a consumer product. Sure. Where you rely on uh, distributors, distributors and yeah. retailers to sell your product. Um, sure. Right? Um, yeah. 
So you know, there, there you've got, so the, it's still a B2B sale because your customer is another business. The end user is the consumer, Excuse right? You. So for those um, distributors, have to make sure that they're, what are, the, what are they looking for? Maybe it's a new product to sell. Uh, maybe it's uh, more revenue, more, more profit. And then how do you help them sell to their consumers, right? And so it's almost like you've got two kind of sales and marketing plans. One, to support your partner, and the other to help support them sell to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Some partners will be better at selling to the consumer than others, um, so you can work on that. The biggest thing with those type of relationships is expectations. What are your expectations of them? What are their expectations of you? How much would you like them to sell? You know, what types of opportunities would you provide a discount? Um, you know, those sort of things, right? Uh, what support are you gonna give them? So all those, that's the biggest challenge in working with partners is setting those expectations so both parties are on the same side. Okay, perfect, thank you. Sure. Hey, hi Mark. Hey. Um, I was just curious to know, um, we talked about objections. Yeah. I'm sure this is not an unusual uh, issue, but for startups that are trying to go in with the RFP process, sure. how do you do that with organizations that are looking for a whole bunch of criteria? And their biggest issue is, hey, you're a nobody, you're coming in, I'm, I don't want to take the risk. Sure. How do you kind of attack that? So one of the things you can do is look for the early adopters. And that happens, that can be public sector entities as well. So what I would do is, and the, the biggest rut you can fall into as a sales, uh, on the sales side is answering RFPs because they come out. They get posted on boards, it's easy to download them, it's usually free to submit, but it takes a lot of time. So what I would do is try to find those organizations that are maybe, that where your solution is new for them. And if you find the right organization, they'll help you with the RFP process because you can show them great value. But if an organization is more stayed in their ways, and they want you to have 10 things, and if you don't, you fail, then you know, that's, I wouldn't answer that RFP, right? And it's not an easy thing to do, but you need to find those ones that are willing to, to take a risk or ones that don't put a heavy percentage of the response on those past experiences. Um, but you know, it is, government, banks are more risk averse than other entities. But you can find very progressive cities. You know, you can find very progressive uh, provinces. You can find you know, very progressive financial institutions. Um, you just have to, have to look for them. Great, that's good, thanks. Sure. Hi, Mark. Um, my question pertains to when you were talking about different um, competitors, and when sure. you talked about trying to compete against the status quo, sure. that's the biggest problem I have. I definitely have competitors, but my biggest problem is the apathy and ignorance to do something about what I'm trying to solve. Sure. If you could provide any tips and tricks to get the people to act when they have the ability to continue to do nothing. Yeah, I think part of it is the, you know, part of it is you have to find sometimes those early adopters, and sometimes you can find them by looking at their website and seeing maybe they've done other things that are you know, different than people in the industry. Uh, maybe it's in how they're, you know, if you think about, think about banks, uh, CEO of ING Direct, I think it now is Tangerine, I believe, or maybe not quite Tangerine yet, but it soon will be Tangerine. Uh, he's on Twitter, if anyone wants a great follow on Twitter. And uh, I have a client that helped sell into them a social media tool internally that they would use, right? So, you know, if you're looking for somebody that's maybe a leader that's doing things differently, <laughs> and, you know, then that's a good sign that maybe internally they'll, they'll, they won't just accept the status quo. There'll be other like-minded individuals. So trying to find those things on the outside looking in, because again, you're not gonna be able to, just because you have a way to overcome the objection, <laughs> doesn't mean that they're willing to listen to it. Sometimes they don't know what they don't know. And so trying to find those organizations individuals that are willing to take a risk, find those early adopters, and do that research ahead of time. And it could be other products they've purchased that are maybe a bit different, um, that you can, you can try to leverage as a way to have that early focus on people that you think may 
be able to change. And the best way for them to think about changing is quantify the benefits of the solution you bring. They say, well, we're not interested in changing. What if I could save you 20%? Uh, I'm interested in saving 20%, right? Um, so that may be, as an example, something to work on. One hazard you, uh, one may come across is people who look like prospective customers, but in fact are just going to jerk you around yes. for a number of reasons. They can be uh, pretending to have more sale, more purchasing authority than they have. Uh, they just want to use you as a lever against the people for whom they're really going to buy, or they're using you for research. How do you recognize these people and uh, bail out with the minimum amount of effort? Um, I think one of the ways you can... So, I find that when you're dealing with those individuals, sometimes one of the ways you can find out is if they don't want you to meet anybody else within the company, right? And they may say, I better not hear you going to anybody else in the company. You know, that's a, that's a really strong indicator that, you know, I don't understand why they would want to do that. So maybe asking to meet other people, asking questions about the sales process, and also setting up timelines for next steps. You know, hey, you th thought the demo was good. What's the next step? You know, how do we make, you know, how do we make this go forward? Uh, and um, and that and that could be, you know, and they say, well, we should know by, you know, in January, okay, you know, it's January. What, what, has it gone forward or not, right? You know, and um, and then, you know, ask, asking them to introduce you to somebody else in the company. Hey, I'd love to talk to. You. This may be a good opportunity. And if they're if they're not, then that could be the case. It's not easy always to find them out. The more of them in bigger companies than there are in smaller companies, I find. But yeah. Hello, I'm Fiona from a company called Women Who Run It. We're digital publishers, particularly in women's um, magazines. My question pertains to LinkedIn on a business page and, and dealing with that as opposed to keeping the personal pages up as well. Right. So I, I, I think a good LinkedIn strategy is both. Having the company page, but then also having the individual page. Uh, and the company page is a great um, place to post company updates, have everybody connected to the organization. You can get some great analytics from it. But at the end of the day, I think for the most part, people are connecting to people on LinkedIn versus organizations. So I would still recommend that the people that are customer facing within organizations have LinkedIn and active LinkedIn profiles. Um, and there's some tools you can use that make it really easy to do updates, things like Hootsuite. There's another uh, Toronto-based company called Post Beyond, and uh, they have a really easy tool that allows you to update uh, LinkedIn and Twitter pages, um, sends a, a digest email in the morning, so people that aren't really great on social media can seem like they're really great on social media. And you know, it just allows, again, that your LinkedIn, the great thing about LinkedIn today, for the most part, is stuff, for the most part, is free. Free is good. You can spend a little bit of time with a free tool. Your time costs money, but you know you can leverage that. Um, so I, you know, I really like Twitter, LinkedIn. My two favorites are B two B, and I spend probably twenty minutes, a half hour every day on LinkedIn and Twitter to do total. If I'm doing research or something more, I'll spend a bit more time. But that's I would I am on every day with those two tools. As opposed to Google Plus or something like that, adding that into the mix? Yeah, I would say Google Plus. Again, if anybody has a really good Google Plus story they want to share with me afterwards, I'm happy to listen. Uh, uh, you know, I, I used to have a I used to have a chart that said, you know, here's you know, here are these different types of social media who's on them, and Google Plus was other Google employees, right? Um, but you know, I think that there's some really promising things about Google Plus. Uh, one of the big, thing, big, big things is Google is the biggest search engine. <laughs> so there's a few little things you can do on Google Plus, but you know, and you can be a little bit active. But I, I'd say LinkedIn and, and Twitter, at short term, are the best. Um, anyway, Facebook may be interesting if you're, you know, if you if you're dealing with more consumers and Pinterest and Instagram may be interesting if you're dealing with very visual solutions. But for the most part, for B2B sales, it's it's number one is LinkedIn, number two is Twitter. Just a quick question. If your uh, business model has both um, users and customers, would you, is there anything you do different to uh, sell to users as opposed to your customers? I know it's basically trying to get the benefits across the same thing, but I just wonder if there's anything. 
um, differently? Uh, I think it, you know, get the benefits across, but if you have users, you know, make it easy for them to use your solution, make it easy for them to sign up, make it an enjoyable process. You know, it's where you've got your customers that are paying for it and your users that are using it. So, you know, try to make it as easy as possible. Okay. But that's also where social media can be very helpful on the customer service side too, right? People have a question, you can get back to them. Nothing worse than seeing a Twitter stream with just broadcasts, <laughs> no interaction, no at replies. Right. So, you know, that, that's a good way that, you know, if you've got an unhappy user <laughs> and you can help make someone happy, that's a good, good opportunity. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you very much. I'm your fan, number one. I always see you in, the, in, um, in Mars, in the, in the website of Mars. Um, there is any book that you would recommend me to um, write properly, uh, proper emails and, uh, and, uh, and also uh, introduction for my, I mean, introduce myself with someone who is a potential uh, client. Yes. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm a little bit shy person and I love selling, but it doesn't go together, you know? Yeah. So I, I just would like to know if there is uh, some uh, uh, recommendations for, for me out there. Yeah, like I think you know, I think one of the ways you can make it be be less shy is to practice. You know, if you have an email you want to send, send it to a friend, send it to a colleague. If you have a, you know, we do this all the time. We do practice uh, telephone calls. We work with a new client. We'll do calls, pretend to be the customer. Uh, you know, and you can give your and your because you know what the answer is. There, you know, you'll be more nervous with somebody you know than sometimes with a, with a prospect. So you can do those things to make it easy. And creating that templated email so that I'm changing a few things in it okay. and I know where I'm changing them, so it makes it really easy to send out new emails. Okay. But I would just practice and, uh, and share and get some feedback and continue to practice and share and get feedback. Okay, thank you very much. Sure, can you mute the microphone though just so everyone can hear? Anybody online? Yep. Oh, yeah. There's there's lots of people on the webcast, so we that's why we use the mics. Any any questions? Um, nope. Nope. Okay. We're... So I have one more question about um, <clears throat> your business hours on Twitter. Yeah. So, what do you feel about having a block of time? Like, say you know you don't have all the time in the day. Yeah. Right, and you can't. It's after it's 10 p.m. or whatever. Sure. You're, Heading to bed and people are still trying to contact you. Yeah. Uh, do you suggest are, if you're selling? Are you selling a business to consumer or a business to business? It's a it's a business co to consumer product. Yeah. So, um, but you know, so there are, there are third parties you can engage to help that out. Um, but you know, would you think, would you suggest having like it explicitly? You know, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. will be available. You know what I mean? Yeah, I would say look at your biggest market. And you know, be you know, be available. But you know, even any, anyone follow like Hootsuite as an example. Hootsuite has uh, like a Hootsuite customer service, and it says, "Hey, I'm signed on in the morning, <laughs> and we're going to bed, right?" And so that's a really big, that's a multi, you know, valuation of a billion and more dollars. Um, so I, you know, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with even on your Hootsuite on your t Twitter account saying, "Hey, well." These are our hours we'll get back to you in, right? And having that, having that listed under your, under your handle. Now, do you, do you suggest something like that in the beginning? Or because, you know, money doesn't stop. It's 24 hours a day, right? So Sure. You but know. what I would do is do it at the beginning and see if it's an issue, right? Because okay. you can find third parties to do it. It may be expensive. Yeah. So I would do it at the beginning and see how it works out. You know, if you're not selling something that someone's gonna hurt themselves with, hmm. you know, that you need to get on and tell them how to stop the blood flowing. <laughs> you know, you should be, you know, you should probably be okay to get back to them the next day, right? So, you okay. uh, know, I think probably okay. You know, you don't wanna let someone flame out, but, you know, I think if you have a nice response back to someone that's flamed out, um, pe you know, people will see that and, and, you know, and respect it. Thanks. Sure. And we do actually have a question online. So just the last question tonight is from Jen. Uh, she asks, when finding contacts to email and call, it seems difficult these days to find the right contact information. Often there's only a general email address and you never know if they even get the message. Um, do you have any solutions for that? Absolutely. Um, this, you know, we talked about data.com, which used to be called Jigsaw. 
it's a great tool that you can use to find those hard to, hard to reach emails. And then the other thing I would do is LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn is, is a great tool. Um, you might have a second connection to someone at that organization that can make an introduction. If you have the paid, uh, paid LinkedIn, you can send a message to someone that's outside your circle as a, almost like a cold email. So that's kind of, if you can't find someone, you can always send an in, an in mail uh, to them as well if they're on LinkedIn. Link, LinkedIn is brilliant. Like for $200 a year, you get a premium package, which means you can send emails or what they call in mails to people you don't know. And it has their title, their photo, what their responsibilities are. You can see their whole profile if you're not connected to them. It's an amazing tool. So I would second the LinkedIn. Yeah. And also, you know, don't, don't t try a, the job title, the person's name and email and see what comes up. You'd be surprised, yeah. probably one out of 10 times, you'll find that person's email on an alumni magazine, on a, they volunteered at a hospital. I know I'm sounding like a car, used car salesman right now, <laughs> but, but they're, you know, it's out there, right? So I think if you, if you know that you've got a benefit you can provide to your target, then why wouldn't they want to hear about how you can help them out? That's my perspective on it. So any other last questions? Yes. Can you go to a microphone though, yeah? Yeah, there's this one over there, yeah, perfect. This is more of a comment than like a question, but sure. uh, the beauty of uh, B2B is that you're dealing with entities that are kind of logical, that make decisions that are rational, whereas like B2C, uh, like I'm not, I can't tell you why like a girl would, would buy a $100 pair of yoga pants, right? But uh, for B2B, there's, they're either trying to increase revenue or save costs, right? So whenever you're, you're shaping your pitch, Always ask yourself, like, so what? Like, if you're, uh, if you're an SEO expert or whatever it is, I can get you on the uh, first page of Google. If you ask your, your customers, going to be like, so what? Yeah. Right? Which means more clicks. So what? Which means more revenue, more money for your business. So yeah. whenever you're tailoring your pitches, like, make sure that you could clearly, your customer could clearly see whether he's going to make more money or save money rather than just kind of yeah. all the frills. I, I would agree that for the most part, businesses are supposed to be run logically. But the problem is people work at those businesses. And they're not uh, logical. So I would agree with you. But you know, for the most part, and, and not always the way, uh, but yes, the most part, if you're going to help the business save money, increase revenue, that's the kind of, you know, avoid something bad, increase productivity, those are the things they want. And they don't want to know what SEO is. They want to know you're going to drive revenue for them, right? So I would agree with that 100%. I would agree with it 90% because there still are people within businesses that still make illogical decisions. Um, I just have one final thought. I, I think it's really interesting because in sales pitches, you always say, you know, do your research, do your research, but you'd be really, really surprised how few people do research. It's kind of like if you've ever done interviews and had people interview, they they, they really spend very little time researching the company. So you can stand out by by spending more time on LinkedIn, figuring out what are the responsibilities of the person you're meeting, um, what are the challenges of the business, what are the challenges of the industry, asking and formulating some good questions so that when you're having the conversation, you're able to tailor your message back to what matters to them and always have that two-way thing. It sounds simple, but you'd be really amazed that people don't do research and it's a way to stand out. Would you agree, Mark? Yes. I would agree. And I'll, you know, if you have an hour meeting, you should almost do an hour of research to prep for the meeting. Um, not, no, maybe not, maybe half an hour, but you should do the, do the research to get ready for it. And even something as little as, hey, I noticed that you were, you're also connected to someone I know, and here's what I did for them. You know, like, again, bring, you know, that could build instant credibility for you at that meeting gets started, right? So there's so many opportunities to find information out, you know, take advantage of them. So, great. Uh, I'm gonna stick around for a few more minutes afterwards if someone has another question or is maybe shy and they don't wanna ask it. Uh, so I'll be up here for a little bit longer if people wanna come up and ask a couple more questions. But thank you everyone. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for, bra you know, for uh, great presentation. braving the storm and uh, get everyone get home safe. <laughs>